Welcome back to the channel. All right, today we are doing an academic video and we're talking about trailing spouses. To start, what's a trailing spouse? So the Wikipedia definition, and I know Wikipedia isn't a good source for stuff, but for something like this, I think it's okay. Um, students out there, I feel as a teacher, former teacher, I need to advise you that if you're gonna use Wikipedia, use it as a jumping off point. It tends to be well-referenced, follow up on those references, figure out what they were trying to say, what the actual source says, stuff like that. But for like a cultural thing like this, we're going to say it's okay. Okay. So the Wikipedia definition of a trailing spouse is used to describe a person who follows their life partner to another city because of a work assignment. The original people this term applied to were the military spouses, typically wives, especially historically, who would have to follow their partner when the partner was assigned to somewhere like Germany or Japan and was going to be there for a while. Their wife or husband would have to decide if they wanted to go with them or spend however many years apart. And this usually involved uprooting the kids, getting them to the new country, and it's a huge thing. Definition out of the way. Bear with me a second. We're going to go nostalgic here because I am a kid of the 80s and I promise it's relevant. So one of my favorite movies as a kid was The Last Starfighter. And it's horribly 80s, but there's still tons of references from it in pop culture today. So that means it's still cool, right? So the movie plot from my recollection, here we go. The movie follows the main character, whose name is Alex, I think, and he lives in a trailer park. I think he's working as like a fry cook or something. Also in the trailer park is his girlfriend, who I think is a waitress. I'm not sure. But Alex, his passion is this video game cabinet thing, arcade game called The Last Starfighter. And finally, he gets a high score on it. That night, he is approached by somebody who's like, get in my car. And he's like, no, and the guy's like persistent, so finally he does, because 80s. And then it turns out that this guy was using the cabinet, the game, the arcade game, to recruit people who were really good at it to fight for this galactic force. And so Alex is recruited, most of the training was done by the video game, and to spoil a 30-year-old movie, which the trailer also does too, I'm going to have that playing, uh, Alex saves the day. He is awesome. Defeats some critical force of the bad guys. And at the end, he's allowed to go home to offer his girlfriend a chance to go with him. Leave the trailer park behind. And so she does. And that's where the movie ends. As I said, I promise I'll come back to this. It's relevant. I promise. Trust me. A little backstory about me. Before we get into some points summarized in the Wikipedia article about issues for trailing spouses, related to trailing spouses, things of that nature. And yeah, it's a little not PC because, I mean, the PC term, I guess, would be trailing partner, but historically it's trailing spouse and that's what we're going to call it. Future me note. As I'm trying to find a fun image for the background of definitions and stuff, I'm seeing a push to call people in my situation expat women or expat men or expat whatever identity, because this is sort of going back to an idea I talk about in the NPD video with like the phrasing of stuff where a central part of my identity isn't necessarily that I'm a trailing spouse. That's not the important thing. It's giving the trailing partner more agency in things. So there is a push to see it called that. So just for awareness purposes, there is also that. Although at this point, I'm not living in a different country, so I'm no longer an expat. So it's just complicated. And I identify as a trailing spouse. So that's what we're going with. When I was growing up, money was always tight. We never had a new car, which isn't that abnormal. We never went without food, so it definitely could have been worse. But 
vacations were always done by staying at like KOAs and national parks, which, you know, it's kind of cool. But if the weather was bad, we didn't have the option of staying at a motel. Like we had to make do with camping. And if things broke, we had to save up to fix them. Like a dryer broke at one point. So there were six or seven months of hanging up our clothes while they saved up to fix a dryer. If a car broke, you know, that was a crisis. So money was tight. And so this idea of the hero coming back and taking his girl with him on some faraway adventure appealed to me. You know, I didn't go super into all the girly girl stuff, but that notion of being taken away on a magical journey by my internal love or whatever definitely appealed to me as a kid. Other context before we get into the meat of the Wikipedia, I basically married my high school boyfriend. We started dating sophomore year of high school and then got married partway through undergrad for financial reasons. And yeah, so we've been together over half our lives at this point. And we've known each other before we really were settled into like what we were going to do with our lives. In high school, deciding on where to go to undergrad, there was a great in-state school option that I was able to talk my husband into going into and to talk to him out going into the army, which pre-2001 was a good call. And <laughs> so we went to the same school for undergrad. I got him into physics. I got out of physics because that's what I thought I wanted to do. Turns out I can't do physics. And then for grad school, as I mentioned in the applying to grad school video, I applied to 10 schools. He applied to nine. He got into two. I got into one. And we just lucked out that one of those schools overlapped. And so that's where we went. We didn't have to make that tough decision yet. And in grad school, as I mentioned in the job drama video, when we were nearing our end in grad school, we decided that we didn't want to do the long distance thing. We wanted to stay together. Whoever got the best offer, we would go with that and the other person would make it work. Funny story, husband thought that I was going to get the offer and he was going to make it work, but it turns out there's a bigger need for physicists than there are psychologists. Surprise. Sorry, honey. Husband got the postdoc. I became a trailing spouse. During his postdoc, I was able to be an adjunct, so that worked. After that, he became a scientist on his experiment, which required him being basically the on-call, on-site person for the experiment, which necessitated us moving to the middle of nowhere. And in the middle of nowhere, rural America, there's not exactly a huge need for cognitive psychologists. I tapped the local university, see if they needed teaching help, no dice, and so my options were like fast food, like McDonald's, or getting a commercial driver's license and driving oil trucks. Neither of those were really appealing. My husband was being paid very well for the area we were living in, so I'll work on my skills and worked on learning various things. And yeah, the experiment ends. He's brought back to home base for his job, basically. And I moved with him. And that was the beginning of this year. Here, we thought I'd have an easier time finding a job, especially with some of the skill building I'd been working on. But either I'm overqualified or I'm underskilled and there is no in between. And video for another day. But now I'm trying to make it work. So again, trailing spouse is basically somebody who is following their spouse who has been assigned a job somewhere. This is, as I said, frequently a military thing, but it's also true for academics, especially what we call the dual PhD, where both people in the relationships have a PhD. And that can be difficult trying to find solid work for both of them in the same place. Let's start working through the issues summarized in the Wikipedia article. First is professional sacrifice. Basically, the trailing spouse has to abandon 
their career potentially if they have one established when their spouse gets whatever job that requires them move. Or if somebody's very lucky, they're able to transfer their current career to whatever the local office would be. That's very rare. Usually the trailing spouse basically has to quit and then try to pick up at the new place. Personally, at this point, I would be shocked if I end up back in academia, both in terms of what I want to do and also in terms of my competitive ability for getting a job in that field. I'm not competitive anymore, and that's how it is. Another issue is that because of the period we spent in rural nowhere, I have a three-year gap on my resume. A lot of people, when they have hundreds of applications come in, are looking for anything to disqualify people. And having a three-year gap on your resume, they ask what's wrong with this person. Why, why weren't they working? What's going on? And boom, all of a sudden you're no longer in the running. So that's a problem. And that's something I'm trying to address. And yeah, it sucks. The second issue brought up by the Wikipedia are family issues. These are stresses caused by social, financial, and cultural strains placed on the family relationship as a result of the assignment. You know, there's several different ways you can go with this. Fortunately, we don't have kids, so it's not like every time we've moved, had to uproot the kids. They lose their friends. They lose their school. They lose all of that. You know, we just had cats, so easy. One issue that I did feel is during my husband's postdoc, we didn't live in the U.S., and so flying back for me was prohibitively expensive. It cost more than we could really afford for me to fly back and just visit family. My husband was able to fly back for work and then just divert a little bit, spend a couple days visiting family and friends back home, but I wasn't able to. His work didn't, for some reason, want me to go with him as like a personal assistant or something. Go figure. I mean, if an emergency happened with my mom, we probably could have made it work. But short of that, I didn't go back and visit. Another strain on us was a financial one where almost all of our bills were in the U.S. My student loans, my husband's student loans credit cards racked up during college, and a mortgage from a place, little place we bought pre-bubble pop. We've been renting it out, but, you know, only recently have we started really making money on that. All our bills were basically in the U.S., and we were living in a different country whose dollar was not as strong as the U.S. dollar, basically the entire time we were there. And so we were having to send money back into the U.S., take an exchange rate hit, and try to pay those bills. And that sucked too. Another issue is some people, like my sister-in-law, I think have a low opinion of me. My sister-in-law thinks that if you have a PhD, that means that you can just go to the job tree, shake it, and jobs will fall at your feet. And that's not the case, at least with the psychology PhD or cognitive psych PhD. The jobs just don't fall from the job trees like they used to. And because I'm not getting a job readily as a PhD, that means there's something wrong with me, or I'm lazy, or I'm stupid, or I'm not trying, or you know any other number of things other than it's not just easy to get a job with a PhD just because you have a PhD. And I think a lot of people have that conception that PhD equals a job, and that is certainly not the case anymore. Maybe it was 20 or 30 years ago, but it is not the case anymore. The third issue raised by Wikipedia, barriers to mobility, has two parts. The first is my willingness to relocate, and basically since I've never really gotten a job, you know, that's easy, done, I'll move no prob. But for other trailing spouses, that is more of an issue for them. I know some trailing spouses who initially moved with their physicist husband in both cases, and one of them looked around at the situation, 
looked at what her options were and decided nope, and then moved back to her home country. And the other decided this is okay, I can make this work, isn't using her degree at all, and has basically just been doing philanthropy work and raising their kids. And she's found happiness and contentment in doing that, but you know, it is a shame that she had to sacrifice what she'd worked towards in order to stay with her husband and her kids. The second part of this is a lack of support by sponsoring employer to address the needs of the trailing spouse. Basically, what this means is when you have somebody getting hired, sometimes you're able to negotiate a spousal hire. I've seen this happen in university settings, usually within the same department, where the department really wants one person and they're like, hey, my wife or husband is also a physicist. Can you make something work? And because they really want this person, they do. Either like a full tenure track professorship job or, you know, like a statistics analysis job that eventually transitioned into a full time tenure track job. But in either case, the sponsoring employer was able to help place the spouse. That doesn't always work out, though. It typically hasn't worked out for me. When my husband was a postdoc, he was talking to his department secretary. And they were talking about like me for some reason, and my husband brought up that I was just finishing my PhD. And his secretary was like, oh, yeah, no, the psychology department, they're always looking for people. She should apply. So it wasn't necessarily a spousal hire, but, you know, it was kind of through a connection. I was told about the job and then able to get the adjunct job sort of on my own merits. His employer wasn't really able to pull any strings for me when we lived in the middle of nowhere because I did not have any of the skills they needed for the experiment. And beyond that, they really couldn't hire me for anything. Where we are now, his bosses have tried unsuccessfully to help me find something. And, you know, they've gone through their networks, passed around my resume and CV, And gotten a couple tentative bites, but nothing solid has developed yet. But due to the nature of their work, they're not able to just make me a job. And so here I am. And again, this issue comes up where at least one of my husband's bosses has said that, oh, she has a PhD? She should have no problem finding a job. Which, again, thanks, husband's boss. But no, I am having trouble finding a job, and I don't think it's because there's something inherently wrong with me, but you know, maybe I'm wrong. The fourth issue raised by the Wikipedia article are work-life challenges. These are difficulties associated with finding and maintaining meaningful work or other sense of worth while on assignments. I can definitely relate to this one. Before I did adjunct, I was feeling like I was pimping myself out to the lowest bidder. During the process, it ended up being a little bit better, although it was definitely humbling because I was absolutely the lowest person on the totem pole. Some members of the faculty were absolutely great to me. They were actually trying to encourage me to stay and figure out a way for me to get off of a contract year-by-year position. Not full tenure track, not faculty, but something, so that's nice. But other people in the department wouldn't acknowledge me in the hallway, wouldn't make eye contact. I could be like, hi. And they would just walk right on by, not even acknowledge my presence. And I was also told that adjuncts were allowed to attend the department meeting every month, but I was strongly advised not to say anything. I was told that contract workers who speak up are often not asked back. So great. When we lived in rural middle of nowhere, it was definitely an issue. Trying to find meaning in being a housefrau when this was something I never thought I'd be doing with my life was difficult. It was basically throwing everything I'd built up about myself as an identity away. And that's going to relate to the next point. And as we've been here, Finding meaning in job hunting is difficult, but trying to pivot, 
trying to build this YouTube thing and find some meaning in all of the education and training I've received and pass on some of what I've learned to whoever ends up watching this. So issue number five is loss of identity. As I said with the last point, you know, being the trailing spouse, I don't think anybody plans their life for that necessarily, especially if you go a PhD route. I was told from an early age, you know, how smart I was, how gifted I was going to change the world, go to higher ed, go to grad school. You're going to make something of yourself. You're going to do these amazing things. And then it doesn't work out that way. And now basically my job is maintaining the house and I was not prepared for that. I don't know if I still am. It sucks. It's a huge blow to the ego that I wasn't able to make it as an academic or in industry for various reasons. And here I am. And so everything I'd built up about what I knew about myself, I had to question it. Some things had to be changed. And that process of change and growth can be difficult. Also with this, it can be hard to feel like your own independent person when you are 100% dependent on your spouse, at least financially. That's hard. The sixth issue is gender, and this basically is that this trailing spouse experience can be different for men than it is women. And my heart absolutely goes out to any guy going through this because it's hard enough as a woman And there aren't sort of these, to use the jargon, patriarchal expectations that I'm going to be the primary breadwinner and I'm going to be the moneymaker and I'm going to care for and provide for my family. Those aren't expectations that were necessarily placed on me that would be placed on men. And so to follow your spouse or your partner as a man and not be able to find work and sort of have to put your training and everything and your career on the back burner, I can see a lot of pressure and societal judgment being thrown that guy's way, and that sucks. I do think that's one of the things that feminism is trying to work towards, this idea that you know, if you're a trailing person, man or woman, you know, it's not because you're less than other people. Situations arise, life happens, and sometimes this is the way it works out. And if you're the trailing partner, you're making a choice to stay with your person because of love and kind of doing it in the face of sacrificing your career. That's not everybody's choice, and it shouldn't have to be, but for those of us who choose it, and I completely ignored the siren. Here's hoping it didn't record. To connect this back to The Last Starfighter, like I said, when I was a little girl, I loved this idea of being swept away and sort of rescued by somebody who loved me deeply enough to come back for me. And I think it was when we were living in the middle of nowhere that for some reason I thought about this and sort of realized this is almost the situation I'm in. My husband has amazing skills as much as he denies it. And he's a good physicist. And so he's wanted for that. And He's able to take me with him, sweep me up away from the situation I was in, and take me with him. It's just that the movie ends right at the point where they're going off on their adventure. And this is sort of the after of that. This is like being at the space station and her realizing she has no friends and family nearby. They're all however far away and she can't go back home and visit them. And... She needs to make it work now. So I was thinking of going through some anecdata of like people in my program, people in my husband's program, or on his experiment collaboration thing. I think I'm just going to do some broad strokes instead because it's kind of boring. In both psychology and physics, 
there's been dual PhD relationships where one person finds a job, the other person follows, sometimes with success in finding a job, sometimes not. There's been dual PhD relationships where the people decide to live apart. This can be a couple hours apart. This can be a couple states apart. This can be an ocean apart. Some of them are still together. Some of them are divorced. You know, and it's really hard to say who would stay together and who would get divorced. Like, I really don't know how to predict that well. Just, it happens. Certainly, a lot of people at least in the psychology department where I went to school, most of them met their spouse after they got their job appointment. So they became a professor and then they met their spouse. Sometimes it was a student. That's a story for another day. And, you know, sometimes it was just somebody they met through some event or something. So to summarize, trailing spouses are a thing. It's not destined for you if you are going into a PhD program. Maybe if you don't already have somebody in your life, maybe you'll meet somebody there. Maybe you won't. Maybe you'll meet somebody after you get your academic job. Maybe you won't. You know, life is weird. With trailing spouses being a thing, basically, for the, those of us who are trailing spouses, I think maybe I'm speaking for all of us. Maybe it's just me. But... I chose to go with love over my career. I 100% don't regret it, but would appreciate a little understanding from other people about my situation. It's not an easy situation. It's not what I thought I'd be doing with my life 15 years ago, but here I am. And I am trying my hardest at making a living or finding my new path in life and Yeah, it might end up being something weird like YouTube. It might be something else. Who knows? If you find yourself as the trailing spouse, prepare yourself that you may never find a relevant job, possibly again, and that you need to find meaning in what you're doing with your life somewhere. Maybe not your job, but somewhere. And finding basically your bliss can be difficult, but it is worthwhile to do so and spend some time soul searching and figuring out how you're going to find meaning in your life. Because if you don't, it can be very hard and soul sucking and maybe lead to resentment between you and your partner. And then that's, that's just a dark path towards divorce. If you end up having that little seed of resentment planted. Finally, just if you know a trailing spouse, Now you know a little bit more about their situation, if you didn't already, and to just please have a little understanding and maybe empathy for what they've been through and what they're going through. If you guys have any questions or comments about this, if you are a trailing spouse and have a story to share, I'd love to hear it in the comments or on Twitter. Call to action, subscribe, like, you know, click the little buttony things. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye.